you speak on F signature of some hypersurfaces. Okay, so thank you, Mark. So first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and speak in front of such a big and great audience of uh, mathematicians of many generations. And yeah, thank you very much. So the work I want to present today is a signature of some hypersurfaces, and it is a joint work with Francesco Zerman, a PhD student in, in Genoa. So let me start by fixing some, some notation. We will work over A, which is the power series ring in S variables. Uh, you will use the letter S to denote the number of variables. I want to keep N to be the argument of the functions we will consider, and I will assume the field K is perfect. And of positive characteristic P. Then we consider an ideal I inside A, and we will work over the quotient R, R mod I, and I will denote by M the maximal ideal in R. So the function I'm going to define can be defined in much more general setting, but since the results will be here, so we will restrict from this from the beginning. So we'll start with the introduction. So, and we start with the Hilbert Kuhn's function, which I will denote by HKR of n, where n is a positive integer, and this is nothing but the length of the quotient of R modulo the Frobenius powers of m p to the n. And this is the Hilbert Kuhn's function, which has been already introduced in previous talks, and has been studied first by Kuhn's, who took as a model the, the hilbert samuel function, where here we take ordinary powers of the ideal, instead here we take the Frobenius power, so mp square brackets p to the n is the ideal generated, but all powers uh, of p to the n of the element of, of, of the maximal ideal. And it was Monsky who gave to this function the name hilbert kuhns and also Monsky proved that asymptotically it grows with a leading term which is polynomial of degree d uh, in p, where d is the dimension of the ring. So there's a leading coefficient, e h k r p d n plus a term which is big O of p d minus 1 n. And the leading coefficient is called the hilbert kuhns multiplicity of the ring, and it's a real number which is always greater or equal than 1. But one can do a little bit better than this if we, for example, assume that R is also regular in codimension one. Then not only we have a leading coefficient, but we have a second term. So H care Rn, the Hilbert Kuhn's P d to the n plus beta, or some, or some real number beta, p to the d minus 1 n, plus big O of p d minus 2 n. And this is due to Unikemek, Dermot, and Monsky in the normal situation and later generalized to regular encodimension dimension 1 by Chan and Kurano. And there are examples by Han and Monsky that prove that one cannot do better, so in general we cannot expect a third coefficient to exist. But I will come back to these examples in a moment. Uh, first, I want to introduce the second uh, big player, or actually the main big player of this talk, which is the F signature function, which I will denote by FSR of n. And this is nothing but the free rank over R of the module R1 over P to the n. So I denote by R1 over P to the n, the overring of R where I adjoin P and roots of unity, and the free rank is the maximum rank of a free direct sum of R. So free rank is the maximum rank of a free R sum. 
And this was introduced by Smith, or studied first by Smith and Van der Bank in the context of ring of finite F representation type. Then Unike and Loichke studied it further in greater generality, and we were interested in the leading coefficient, which I will define in a moment. And it's worth mentioning that all around the same time, also Watanabe and Yoshida introduced the notion of minimal Hilbert Kuntz multiplicity, which is also closely related to, to this. And also for the F signature function, it is known by work of Tucker that it has a leading coefficient denoted by SR, which is called a signature of the ring. And I think I never written anywhere that D, sorry, I said it, but I didn't write it, is the dimension of the, of the ring. So plus a term which is big O of B to the D minus one N. And SR is a real number, but differently from the Hilbert-Kuntz, lies interval in the interval 0 and 1. And much of the effort so far have been devoted to the study of this uh, invariant. I think last week in the school, there have been plenty of time to speak about, about them. And they are very important because, in some sense, they characterize the singularities of the ring. It is known that under mild assumption, both the Hilbert-Kuntz and the F signature are one if and only if the ring is regular. And in general, the idea is that the higher the Hilbert-Kuntz, the more complicated the singularity is, and the closer to zero, the F signature, the more complicated. Let me mention that differently from the Hilbert-Kuntz, which is always positive, the F signature can be zero, and it is known by work of uh, Aberbach and Lochke that it is zero precisely when the ring is not strongly F regular. But the focus for me today is not uh, on the leading coefficient, but more on the function. Because here I wrote a big O term of this, and also here, also, let me say that also for the F signature, in many cases, the, the um, a second coefficient is known. But in general, the shape of the function can be more complicated. And it's not, not clear at all, although many examples are, are known. And here I just wrote a sample of them just to mention how the situation goes. For example, for Steinlein Eisen ring and binomial hypersurfaces, the Hilbert Kuhn's function is known by work of Konka. Then for projective curves, it is known by work of uh, Trivedi and Brenner. And also for normal affine semi-group rings, this is by the work of Bruns and Watanabe. And, and then let me also mention two by two minors of generic matrices. This is also known by work of Miller, Robinson, and Swanson. And concerning the F signature, Fs, the shape and the, the precise behavior of the function is known for uh, normal affine semi-group rings by work of von Korff and sing, and for invariant rings by work of myself and the Stephanie. And for invariant rings, it is known by work of Brinkman, but only in the Hilbert Kuhn's, only for G in dimension two subgroup of SL2 case, so only in this, in this special case. There are some more examples, for example, uh, 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 full frag varieties by work of Fakrudin and Trivedi and some other cases, but not so many. There's still a, a big class I left out that will come uh, to it in a moment. What um, is common to all these examples that in all these cases, uh, the function of Hilbert Kuntz of F signature are quasi polynomial in P. So, what I mean by this, I mean that you can write them as a sum of a i n p i to the n, where i n, the coefficient, are periodic functions. Mm -hmm. 
or eventually they might be constant. In some cases, the function is even a polynomial like the classical case, the Hilbert sum. And of course, the, the, the leading coefficient is known to be constant because it's the Hilbert Kuhn's or the F signature, respectively. And these cases are known, and while there is, a, of course, a, a deep connection between the two functions, it's not clear that the method that will apply to one will apply to the others. For example, I don't know how the geometric methods developed by Trivedi and Brenner could be applied to the F signature function, and also the method that Alessandro and I study here, I don't know if they will extend to the Hilbert Kuhn's. Uh, but still, as I was saying be, before, there's a, a class of example I didn't mention, uh, which is a class of example where the function is not quasi polynomial in P to the N, and these are due to Ann and Monsky, and later by Monsky and Teixeira. And they produce an the example. of non-quasi-polynomial Hilbert-Kunz function. And with this, we come to the second part of the talk, which is uh, p-fractals, where I will try to, to briefly explain what are the methods of Arne Monsky and later my Monsky and and take Sarah for the Hilbert Kuhn's and out, they can be applied to the F signature. So from now on, we restrict to the case of hypersurfaces. So I is now generated by a single element. And so let me add this to the, to the notation. Now I is, in case I raise, just hypersurface. And the idea of and then Monsky and then Monsky and Teixeira is to associate to the hypersurface as a function, uh, which we denote phi f, and takes value in a special set of this form, p to the n, and this is one over p to the s n times the length of a modulo the maximal ideal, Frobenius powers, and f to the a, okay? Maybe I, let me, I think I can erase the table now. Okay, so, the idea is to associate to any hypersurface a function of this, of this form, let's close the parentheses, and this phi f is a function from i to q, where i consists of elements of the form i divided p to the m, where a is an integer, and also m, say two natural numbers, intersection with the interval zero, one. So this is nothing but, if you forget about this factor, this is nothing but the, somehow the Hilbert Kuhn's function of the powers of f, f to the a. In fact, for a equal one, you recover precisely the Hilbert Kuhn's function at, despite this, this somehow normalization factor. But the idea is that if you are able to collect information altogether of this, of this function, maybe you can get some information on the Hilbert Kuhn's, yes. No, S is the number of variables here. So A is still the power series. So yeah, uh, it's the dimension uh, uh, plus one, if you want. That's, okay. So, so far so good. So then they introduce operators of this form. So for any natural number n and any b between zero and p to the n, they define an operator t p to the n b of phi of t p to the m to be the, an appropriate translation of the function phi 
t plus b divided p to the n plus m for any function phi in q to the i. So it's a kind of translation of the function, and they define Monsky and Teixeira, they say that the function phi is a peak fractal if this T P N yes yes sure yeah uh, see yes is a, is a natural number. So the index set, any, any, natural, number. any natural number. So it takes, uh, the, the, the domain is this i, which consists of fraction of the form i divided p to the m. So the denominator should be a power of p, and the numerator, any natural number a. Just like that. And so you, you no, and then you define a function in this way. Given f, the value of this function in the fraction a p to the m is this number. So the length, the here the maximal idea, the a gives you the power of the f, f to the a's. Sorry, maybe it's too small. Yeah, sorry. That's f to the a. So a plays a role in, in the sense that controls the power of the, of the hypersurface. Sorry, it was too, too small. Uh, oh, yes. I'm so used to, to write length over r that, yeah, yeah sorry. That I do it automatically. Thank you. So, and they say that the function, in general, a function in this space from i to q, but one of these forms is a p fractal, is whenever you apply all possible operators of this form for every n and every b, then this spans a finite dimensional subspace of the space of functions. Okay, so, and the name prefractal comes from the fact that if you impose this condition, you can see this function phi from uh, the interval zero one, well, a subset of the interval zero one to, to, to the real positive numbers, and if you assume this prefractality condition, then the graph of the function will have a shape that is kind of a fractal, so that's the, the way of the name. It will repeat itself because the idea is that the function is given only by a finite number of, uh, of information. And in fact, the, one of the main results of Monsky and Teixeira is that if phi f is a p fractal, then the Hilbert Kuhn's series, in the sense of the generating series of a modulo f, is rational. And this implies, in particular, that the Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity is rational. And also, moreover, if you know more information about the relation of this function, you can also try to compute the, the function more explicitly. So uh, the first thing we did with, uh, with Francesco is to, to define a, a weakening of this condition. So we say that phi is a weak prefractal. if only a subspace of these operators, so we consider only operators of the form TPN0 with no B, span a finite dimensional vector space. So, and this has a price in the sense that if you only assume this, then the shape of the function is not anymore so nice. You lose this fractality. But still, this is, and this is our first result, is that in this case, this condition is uh, sufficient and necessary for the Hilbert Kuhn's to be rational. So phi f is a weak prefractal. if and only if the generating series of the Hilbert Kuhn's is rational. So a quotient of two polynomials. So, and this is the first 
statement. The second statement is that if we consider the function phi tilde, which I will introduce in a moment, then this is a weak p fractal. if and only if the generating series of the F signature function is rational. And I tell you what is phi tilde. Phi tilde is the reflection of phi. So phi tilde in a value t is phi of one minus t. So phi tilde of t is this is phi of one minus t. This is called the reflection of phi. Well, of phi f in this case, well, anywhere. So in some sense, what does this tell us? Apart from the, the uh, that we have a, a characterization of the rationality of the series, but I mean, is this useful? So as Trivedi already pointed out, one question is, well, but does this help you to compute well, the answer is yes, because in some sense, this function phi f, when it approaches to zero, it gives you information about the Hilbert Kuhns, and when it approaches the value one, it gives you information about the f signature. And so you may try to use this, these techniques of p fractal to give actual computation of the f signature. And this we'll, we'll do in the, in the third part of the talk. And as a test, we focus first on Fermat hypersurfaces because in this case there were already some open questions that we, we wanted to, to try to answer. So let me now fix the, the notation for the last part of the talk. We consider Fermat hypersurfaces, so ADS is now the Fermat hypersurface in S variables and of degree D. Yeah, so I will denote this by ADS. So now the setting here, well, K is still perfect, but we just now reduce it a little bit. So, but A is still that one. Okay. So, what is known about this? So, first of all, the F purity is known by Oxter and Roberts. In the famous paper that was already mentioned. So we know that there are some cases we, we know what happens. So if D is bigger than S or P is smaller or equal than D, then ADS is not F pure. So, and this for the F signature function means that the F signature is identically zero, so not much interesting. In the case D equal S, then ADS is F pure if and only if D is congruent to one modulo D. And in this case, one can compute that the F signature is identically one. So also not so much interesting. In particular, the ring is not strongly F regular. Now we come to the most interesting situation. Uh, this is identically one, this function for all n. The function, the first signature function, not the, the, the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is zero. Sorry, the, the fun. it means that, f I mean, actually it means that you always have one splitting for every, somehow, for every n in this sense. Yeah, the, 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 the leading coefficient is zero. So in the case when D is bigger than S, then it's known 
that ADS, the Fermat, is strongly F regular, so the F signature, the limit is uh, the leading coefficient is on zero, strongly F rational, uh, for P large enough. Yeah, I mean a regular, sorry, strongly F regular, sorry. Thank you, I got confused. Okay, so, and what we can say in this case, Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Like that, sorry. So what we can say in this case. So let's assume, and then also D is at least two, P is greater than D, and we have a technical assumption, so P is congruent to plus or minus one mod D, and we have that either S P minus one D is even in the case that P is congruent to one modulo D or S times P plus one divided by D is even in the case that P is congruent to minus one mod D then there exist two integers, b and c, where b is between zero and p to the s minus three, s is the number of variables, such that the f signature, maybe I need another chalk, the f signature, function in this case is the F signature times P to the S minus one N, and this was known, plus one minus the F signature times B to the N. And this is true for all N. So we only have two terms in the function, the leading part which we know, and the part which is of the order P S to the S minus three, so the dimension minus two because S is the number of variables, so there exists a second coefficient which is zero, but when B is bigger than one or is not a power of P, there are no more coefficients, so this is not quasi polynomial in particular, and we also know in this case that the F signature is given by minus C B to the S minus one minus B, in particular, it is a rational number. So far, so good. So uh, people may want to know, okay, but can you tell something more precise about this, this value? Well, yes, even in the case S equal to D plus one, which is the, yeah, the first, uh, let's say, interesting case, there's a theorem by Watanabe and Yoshida in 2004. They proved that the X signature function, S signature, sorry, the, the limit, the leading coefficient is more or less equal than one divided by two to the D minus one, D minus one factorial and they ask whether equality holds. And for D equal to, this is, the answer is yes, it is known that this value is one half and the F signature, I mean we get an F signature of a quadric in three variables. This is known by many ways that this is true but for D equal three, we could compute the precise value of S A three four, and this is three P, P minus one, P plus one, divided by eight, three P third, 
minus p plus 2 minus 1 to the alpha plus 1. So a very complicated number, which depends on p, where alpha is either 0, in the case that p is congruent to 1, mod d or 1, if p is congruent to 2, mod d. But in both cases, this value is strictly smaller than 1, 8, which is this value for d equal 3. So in the, the answer for d equal 3 is no. But you may notice that still, if you take the limit for p going to infinity, you get in exactly these three cancels, you get 1, 8. So in some sense, the bound of Watanabe Yoshida is optimal in this sense. So still the value is smaller than 1, 8, but at infinity, it goes to 1, 8. And I think this is all I wanted to say, and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Is there some questions? Or remarks? Or if not, thank you again. Thank you.